tonight. Good to be back here in the house of the Lord. I've been saved 30 odd years and I've never got used to going to church. I don't do much of anything else. I spend the greatest part of my life either sitting on a pew or standing behind a pulpit. When I don't have anything else to do, I'll go home and listen to tape. I'm addicted to this stuff. Amen. I love it. I thank God uh, for saving me and uh, uh, putting me into the ministry. I appreciate it. Appreciate what God's doing. If I didn't have any more religion than some folks, I'd just quit. I really would. I, I couldn't handle it. I, a Sunday morning religion never did, um, just never appealed to me. I told the Lord I'd do anything he wanted me to do except pastor a Sunday morning crowd. I couldn't do that. I, I couldn't handle it. And... Um, our church on Sunday morning, we have about maybe 275, and Sunday night we have about 225, and Wednesday night we have about 225, and, and uh, I'm consistently trying to run them other 50 off. I, I have a hard time with a Sunday morning crowd. Amen, I really do. I, I, don't, know, you know, I don't know what good that is. I, I know some people work, and uh, that's the only what time they can come. Thank God they do come. But uh, I have no time for a Sunday morning religion. Amen. I believe we ought to worship God on Monday morning, Amen. and Tuesday morning, and Wednesday morning, and uh, I learned this a long time ago. If you're going to live for God, you're going to have to get your pastor. You're going to have to love him. I don't care who you are. I have a friend out in Texas, uh, Dr. Joe Webb. We started preaching together, and he's been pastor of the same church about 25 years. Even missionaries, they come and join his church, and uh, uh, they come down and say, we want to join. He said, okay, I'll talk to you after service. He's got a big church, runs about 500. So he takes the missionary back to Mike. Said, "Why did you join this church?" They said, "Well, uh, you know, we, we feel like you ought to be a member of a good church." He said, "Yeah, but you want me to be your pastor, or do you just want to use our church's influence in her name? Do you like me to be the pastor? That means if you're in a foreign country somewhere, you get in trouble. I'm going to come down there and pray with you and bury you dead, and uh, you're going to send an offering every once a month to your church and all that. I mean, you know, you're joining the church, aren't you?" Now, where you're joining to get in, you're not just uh, by your joining. <laughs> you know, I guess maybe we'll just ask everybody that. <laughs> what, what you joining for? Amen. I was at church one time, a guy was joining, he, he was passing out cards. He had a cleaner. I don't know why he joined. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. In our Bibles, in the sixth chapter of Genesis, the Bible said it came to pass 
when men began to multiply upon the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fat, and they took them wives of which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and after that, when the, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that, that every imagination of the thought of his heart was evil only continually. The Bible speaks here of man becoming evil it speaks of his thought life, that his thought life was completely captured by the devil. And I know there were some monstrosities in that day and time, but uh, somehow the devil had invaded the mind of man and got a hold of his mind, and when he did, he become evil continually. He had a hold of his thought life, he got a hold of his heart, and made him an evil, evil man. Now, it repented the Lord that he'd made man on the earth, and it grieves him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, as a creeping thing. I've always hated a creep. Amen? I've always hated a creep. And he crept in unaware. Amen? He's a creep. And the fowls of the air for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, I'd like for you to take verse 8 and verse 9 and 10, what have you, and try to put them together, that you will. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, we talk about grace a whole lot, and we should. Uh, we talk that we're only saved by grace, and that's really the truth. But verse 8 and verse 9 goes together. These are the generation of Noah... Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. Now, the Bible said that Noah found grace, and the same grace that he found began to perfect his life and sanctify and cause this man to walk with God. And that's strange. In other words, he had saving grace, but he also had walk in grace. Amen. I like that. I really do. I kind of believe they go along together. I've always been preaching that anyway. And Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. That sounds like the morning paper. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh, had corrupted his way upon the earth. Now this is strange. And God said unto Noah, a grace preacher. Now this grace preacher had a had a walking salvation. He had a building salvation. He built something for the glory of God. And he was a worshiping grace. Amen. And God said unto the Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them uh, with the earth. And we begin to look here, and the Bible said that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And so I begin to look here, and I, the first thing I want you to look at is the society that Noah lived in. And I, I'm traveling up and down the land and, and nearly every week, and uh, the same stories everywhere. Nobody here in this town is unsaved. And I, that's the way it is in Houston. You go talk to anybody? Everybody's saved until we get through talking to them. I just so I didn't make any difference to me. If you tell me you're a Baptist, I, I just, you know, ask you how long you expect to live and, and uh, what you're going to do when you get to hell. I, I just I quit uh, dealing with people. and uh, uh, You know, it's no use talking to them about it. 
I mean, 99% of the people that you deal with is unsaved. They hate the church. They hate God. They hate the Bible. They hate God's man. They hate the preacher and everything. So you might as well be honest with them. And the, one of my men was working the other day, and a big Baptist preacher was there working in the same place, and Brother Sides was putting up the mail, and, and uh, this preacher, he was laughing, and he said, uh, you're one of them fundamentalists, aren't you? He said, yeah, I'm one of them Baptists that's going to heaven. He said, you're one of them that's going to hell, I guess. And he just kept on, you know. And this guy said, I'd have you to know that I pastor a church one 400 people. He said, I know it. He said, you're, you're one of them. He said, we had one like you saved the other day, said he. He got saved in our church, the Baptist preacher. He said, you've been saved. And that oh, this guy just got mad. He said, what you mad about? He said, if you're saved, that wouldn't bother you. He said, your trouble is your law. And uh, I mean, the next day, this guy asked him out for dinner. He said, you really believe I'm lost? He said, no, I don't believe that. I know you are. He said, I, I mean, I've been watching you for years. You don't witness anybody. You don't care if all these people go to hell. You, you're lost. You're lost. And, uh, you know, that'll kind of jar you up, you know. Yeah. You said, well, he probably is lost. Well, maybe he ain't. But anyway, that'll help him. That'll help him. Nothing else going to help him. At least you'll go out and say, well, at least one thing about it, the man I work with thinks I'm lost. And his wife probably thinks he is, and his church members think he is. It'll help him. It'll help him. Amen? And so we live in a strange society. And God has called us for one reason, and that's to preach to this society. Not that society. Not the future society. But right now, we're to deal with the society that we live in. And so, I mean, this uh, Saturday John goes out on the streets, and... And the mayor was coming by. And uh, and uh, Rick Weimer, he sticks his hand up. He's a big German crowd. And he sticks his hand up and tells uh, the mayor of Houston, you know, where she's a going. I mean, there ain't nothing else to do. I mean, Miss, uh, Miss Whitmire is going to go to hell when she dies. Very religious woman, but she's going to go to hell when she dies. But when she gets there, they're going to say, Shady Acres told you where you were coming. It says, one of them other nuts down on the end had a sign that said, prepare to meet thy God. Amen? Amen? Now, y'all really don't believe this. And many of you say y'all are radical. Well, and uh, your deal won't work. How's yours doing? You know, I used to be very critical. Every great soul in an Irish song that I ever met was kind of an obnoxious fellow. You ever notice that? You, you find some nuts, you know, and I mean, boy, he just, I remember old Bill Trout when he's dead in heaven now, but old Bill just walked up to everybody and said, Yankee, got saved when he's 47 years old. He said, boy, you're going to hell. I'm not, I'm saved. When'd you get saved? And before you know it, he had you on the, uh, on the defense. I mean, you're trying to, and I, I mean, Bill won people to God. Besides, in our church, brother, old, old brother KD, I mean, all, all of them, people who are so in it are obnoxious. My, my dad, he's a, he's a real strange old man. He's really, he's really strange. He's uh, had a stroke, uh, how many, well, one, five or six strokes? And uh, uh, he walks around, and he's just as tottery like this here, and, and, uh, and, and just as tottery, 77 years old, and he tottered. I called home this week, and my mama said, that old crazy fool is down at the rest home preaching! <laughs> he done tottered down there and told that bunch of senior citizens where they were going. Hell. Yeah. An old preacher in our town, an old cowboy preacher, seven foot one, Brother Johnny, you know it. And old, old uh, Old Jack, his name is Jack, too. Bless it, yeah. Old Jack, an old ex-cowboy. And, uh, and so uh, Jack's right up at 80 years old. And uh, so he's a big old man. And, uh, he's having a senior citizen. All the senior citizens. And he got out there and, and he said, it's good to have all you old people here. How many of y'all going to hell when you die? <laughs> oh, oh. Yeah. Uh, oh, you said, Brother Wood, you wouldn't talk to them old people like that. Hey, honey, it's the end of the road. Somebody better tell them. Somebody better warn them. Old Jack Bunny asked him to hold up the hand. How many is going to hell? And the preacher told me, he said, I, his son, he said, I didn't believe it. He said, that big old man preached to them people like he was talking to them people down on the, on the slums down there somewhere. They going to the same place. You can't beautify this message. Listen, this man had a society to preach to. I want you to notice the society that he lived in. The Bible said they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving and bearing and knew not. In other words, it was an ignorant society. They weren't too smart. And we're living in that society today. They're not too smart. And when you tell them about Christ, they got all the answers. When they don't even know the question. Amen. But now this society 
was satanic inspired. I said the society that Noah lived in and preached in was satanic inspired. I'm telling you, the devil was moving in his time. Oh, you say, Brother Wood, it ain't never been like it is now. Oh, yes, it was, too. I'm telling you, that was some strange flesh back in that day and time. I don't know what all was going on, and I don't claim to know, but I'm telling you, there was some monstrosities born in that time, and I'm looking for it to happen any day in my time and your time. Yes, sir. I've seen some pictures of some of these weird old uh, saying, bless God, they look like their mama had a monstrosity. Amen. Amen. I just sometimes want to write him a letter and say, would you please send me a picture of your mama? I'd like to see her. I mean, I mean, some of them guys look like a gyrilla, man. That's right. Amen. And so uh, this society was satanic inspired. Amen. I mean, the devil was moving, and the Bible said he had captured every thought and every intent and blasted their heart and darkened their mind and fixing to damn their soul. They had one hope. The preaching thing there. You see, didn't win many done exactly what God told him to do. And that's all I'm supposed to do. He's satanic inspired. And then they were sexual mad. They were sexual mad. Look at that. We, the Bible said they, uh, he said they were giants in the earth. Oh, you said, oh, what I, I, I don't believe there was, uh, was angels and, uh, I, 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 well, I don't care what you believe. I'm telling you, some funny people were born from them. There were some strange uh, monstrosities and giants born in that day and time. That's all I know. Bless God, I've seen people get married this day and time. Lost people married unsaved people or saved people married unsaved people. I never saw no giants born from them. I've seen some nuts born from some of them. Amen. Some wicked people come out of them. But I ain't never seen no monstrosities. But the Bible said, in, and the minute it happened, God saw the wickedness. A man was great. It was the greatest wickedness there was. It was right here. And they were sexual mad. And I'm telling you today, you live in the the, the, the the fellow on TV. He can't even he can't even tell a joke unless it's got something to do with sex. They got something to do with sex. I mean, they can't even advertise a car. They can't even sell a television. They can't even sell nothing unless it's got something to do with sex. They can't write a song. I'm telling you, they can't do nothing. If you take the sex. Off the radio and the telling, it's doomed. Every song, every rock group, everything is right around sex. And furthermore, it is rampaging even in religion. It's went mad. It's went crazy. We never saw. Or you tell me, preacher, it's always been. It ain't always been this way. I was raised in the slums, and you son, I'm telling you, I never saw what I'm seeing now. I ain't never seen little 11, 12 year old girls lined up waiting to go in the abortion clinic in all my life. I ain't never seen nothing like this. Why, them kids in Houston, uh, they, I, I read the other day, 265 of them under 13 years old had babies that year. Well, tell me it's always been this way. It ain't always been this way. I asked my mother, I said, when in your lifetime did you hear of an 11 year old girl having a baby? She said, I ain't never heard of it until now. I said, well, I asked my dad, I said, if it's always been this way, when, when did you hear in your life time that a man is chasing a little 10 year old boy down the street trying to molest me? He said, I ain't never heard of it. No, you're living in a strange time. I'm telling you, there's sex gone mad. Now, you don't believe what I'm fixing to tell you, but in our city today, one of the preachers right here in this state come down to Houston. He said, I want to see everything. I took him out there in Houston, and he looked at some of that pornography and what have you, and them little bitty kids in that 10 and 11 years old, and he got sick on the street and throwed up right in the middle of the street. Now, you can't have it. You stick your head in the sand. I'm telling you, we're living in a sick society, and the next move has been the boy, but the next year, move is the 9 and 10-year-old girls, and you'll begin to see them on Playboy and what have you. It's headed that way right today. Everybody in the news world today says that the next thing on the agenda, man's done trying everything, but now it's children. The laws, they tried to pass a law just a few months ago, a free preacher friend, John, of ours up there in Washington, D.C., and they tried to remove that it wouldn't be against the law to molest a child under 12 years old. They tried to get a law under 12 years old. That's right. With sex gone mad. You say, I don't like this sermon. Yeah, I know, but you need it. Amen. Because a lot of things I don't like, I just take it anyway. 
Mama said, Castor is good for you. I never have believed that, but she gave it to me anyway. Amen? Amen. And God saw that the wickedness, this is the society lived in. They were satanic inspired. They were not too smart. They were sinful. They were actually supermen. Amen? Amen, Brother Tom? They were supermen. We see some things going on in this chapter that never went on. But we're seeing some things going on in this time. They're supermen. I mean, you take a nut like the Beatles, and he's walking down the road and says, I've got 135 million. Now, that takes a super, a super brain to sack 135, 140 million. He died with 140 million dollars. Now, you take old Elvis Presley. He's shaking in hell tonight. I don't care what you guys to say. He died and went straight to hell's end, and they went to the wigwam. Amen. Amen? Amen? You got that? But he massed together a fortune. Why, Brother Jack? We, we're seeing something that nobody else has ever saw in the history of the world. These people were selfish. They were strange. But the thing is, the preacher came, and they were satisfied. And here we are. This is our society. Okay? Now, we could sit around, Brother Tom, and we could dwell on that our society parallels with this society here. But what has that got to do with this man that found grace? Not one thing in the world. That society's wicked, that society's strange, it's selfish, it's sinful, it's sorry, but God wants somebody to preach to them. God wants somebody to hand them a tract. God wants somebody to tell them that Jesus died for them. Hey, my responsibility is to this society. Yes, sir. We don't want to believe that. Brother John, my, my wife told me this. She said, I went down the street and said, I just want to see for myself. And there's down her hand, that's right. Brother John had a, had a special day, a Memorial Day parade. And uh, he had some tracks made up with a flag. And she said, I noticed, Jack, that young men would take those tracks. Young ladies would take the tracks. Old ladies would take the tracks. A black man would take the tracks. And she said, the brown people, they would take the tracks. But she said, those men from 40 to 55 in their business suits ain't going to take no tracks. Why, preacher? That's the pride of life. That's that period of pride of life. And see, that kid wild in the fashion. You reach him and tell him. But, Brother John, you preach. That's your burden. John goes where the kind of the wealthy people come out in big office buildings, and he just stands there and preaches to them. What are they going to do about it? That's not my responsibility, what they do about it. My responsibility is that they hear that somebody dying for thee. That's my responsibility. My responsibility is offering that track. And if he don't take that track and burns in hell, that's between him and God. But I tell you one thing, it'd be between me and God if I don't warn the wicked from his wicked way. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. So this is the society we live in. In Milton, Florida, everybody's saved. In Houston, Texas, everybody's saved. And really, when you nug it on down, it ain't no harder than nobody's saved. But don't ask your question. Down here in this first public school down, there's probably 2,000 kids in there. So them 2,000 kids ain't never, never, never go here. They live in a sinful society. They're out behind the school line in Houston. I don't know how they are here. How I many we got about 25 uh, uh, high schools? I don't know, Johnny. About 25 high schools. And uh, just great numbers of junior high schools. Probably 50 to 75 big schools down in Houston. And every morning our boys go out there and they, and they get out on them streets and they hand out trout and, and the police try to stop them and, and the officials try to stop them and, and everybody said, leave these kids alone. And you know what they tell us? They said, uh, don't you believe in church, the difference between church and state? And I said, you kind of got me mixed up. You tell me I can't give that kid a trap when he's going into the schoolhouse, but you'll hire men to come down and deal with them when they're in jail. And then, when they get in prison, you'll let our men come down and sit in council with them and deal with them and pray with them. That is state property, isn't it? That's all mixed up. But our men, our boys, are just just thousands of tracks every morning. 7.30, 8 o'clock, meet them kids, thousands of them going into school. Who's going to tell them, Brother Johnny? They're from Catholic homes and Baptist homes and Lutheran homes and Mama says she's saved, she's a drunk, and Daddy said he's saved, he's a pill head, and, and uh, who's going to tell that boy what the real thing is? Does anybody have a burden for that boy? 
Does anybody care if that boy goes to hell? No! The average preacher wants to be on the church. He ain't got time to worry about that boy going to hell. Well, thank you, Brother Wood. Who's going to go down there and stand at that schoolhouse? The lady standing down there where Carl won't run over. Where's the man of God at? Couldn't we go down with a tear in our eye and say, boy, here's a fact. Son, son, don't go to hell. Listen, I, I, you, 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 you can't even believe it. Why, they, th them kids are already at 15 years old. They're so wicked and ungodly. Then in the last few weeks, well, Johnny, you know this to be true. They poured beer on our boys at 7 o'clock in the morning. They're drinking beer. They took marijuana cigarettes, broke them and threw them on our boys like that time. Blowed the smoke out of their grants and, and, and 200 of them behind the school line smoking dope and, and eating pills and all drunk up and, and laying on the ground. I mean, just I mean just having the worst thing you ever saw in your life. And, and the principal said, get away from them. Church is safe. You can't preach to them. Don't you tell them about the Lord. I wonder what Paul would do. I really wonder. He said, oh, brother, when I believe you ought to obey the law. I really believe you ought to obey God. I believe y'all obey God. Brother John just spends his life going up to the courthouse. Do we have any rights? And the other day, the man said, Brother John, just what, just what he told us in him. He said, no, what you're doing is not against the law, but public opinion don't want you to do it. And since they don't want you to do it, you can't do it. That's public opinion. I said, well, you know, it's a public opinion nowadays. Everybody thinks you ought to steal. Is that still against the law? That's kind of public opinion, isn't it? Amen? Okay, thank you. All right, but this society we live in, it's sick, it's under death. Listen, they never listen to God's man. They're completely ignorant of how God used. They're gone pleasure mad. That's the society you live in. And that is right there in the sixth chapter. Now, here's the service that Noah done. That's the society, but here's the service that he done. God, God spoke to him for God's work. He said, I want that ship so long. And so wide. And, what, and God spoke to this man for his service. And I believe that our service ought to be in the church and through the church. And I believe we ought to be connected to the church. I, I'm just a church man. I got saved in a Baptist church. I got called to preach in a Baptist church. I got married in a Baptist church. church. I raised my children in a Baptist I'm just a church person. I, I really am. You say, I, I don't believe in the local church. Well, you've been wrong about some other things. But uh, this man's service was kind of strange. Kind of a strange service. He, he got to praying, and God said, I need a boat. He said, a what? He said, a boat. He said, what's that? He said, that's one of the things that floats. He said, uh, I ain't never, it ain't never rained. It never had rain before, had it? Huh? How are you going to float? Ain't, where, where's any water? But you know, maybe he's like me and you. You know, the society was so wicked, he said, I, I don't think that works. He said, I'll tell you what i got to do. i got to get these people motivated. i got to get me two or three buses or two or three this or two or three that. But, hey, I'm going to tell you, you can get anything you want to. But if you get a hold of where God is, you ain't going to do nothing. You ain't going to do nothing with this society we live in, honey. we got to go past that. You can get a bus, but if you don't soak that bus and pray, and somebody don't get a burden, you're wasting your time. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we don't know what man can do. Yeah. Nothing. We better find out what God can do. Amen, brother. Wood. Amen. Amen. So this service was strange. It was kind of unique. It was kind of unusual. Kind of unusual now. Kind of unusual. You know, building an ark and they come out. What you doing? Kind of unusual. But there's something else, darling. It was completely unwanted. Nobody. And you can believe what you want to. They come by and say, oh, God bless you, Brother Tom. You're the man that passed out at Victory Baptist. Oh, Brother Tom. But God bless They hate your God. They hate your God. Then, and then they talk about hypocrites. And that sorry, low down hypocrite said, Now, God bless you, Brother Wood. You're such a nice guy, you know. And when you walk off, they say, that's, a, that's an old mean preacher. One lady came in our church here one night, and she walked around in there, and she said, She sat there about 10 minutes. She couldn't take any longer. She jumped, she started to the door, and a few days later, Brother Side saw her, and he said, How come you to run off? She said, Well, I didn't see anything, and that reminded me of God. She said, I didn't see any angels in there. And I didn't see Mary and I didn't see nobody in there. I didn't see anything in there but an old loud mouth preacher. And you know what? A few days later, a few months later, that woman got under conviction and she come back. And Brother Dean said, what'd you come back for? She said, I've just been troubled 
ever since I was here before. And you know what our job is? My job not to save that woman. My job is to stab that woman where she'll never get over it. Down the road somewhere, God will deal with her. If we ever get anything done this week, somebody's going to lay in these offices at night. They're going to come a little early. And we ain't going to have near as much fellowship as we are talking to God if we ever get anything done. If we ever get done. I'm telling you, this is a service. And his, his work was kind of strange. But his work was kind of steady. Now, it wasn't up and down, in and out. It was just kind of steady, going, fixing to leave out here, kind of steady. 120 years, pretty steady. Pretty steady. Now, I'm telling you, we live in a time of unstable men, unstable women. I feel led of the Lord to move on down the road. You never felt the only thing you need to be led of the Lord to do is find you a place and just settle in with God. Just get settled in with God. Amen? Amen, Brother Wood. I mean, steady. I mean, steady for 120 years. Now, this job didn't have no pay. And this job didn't have no position. And this job didn't have any prestige. And this job didn't have no politics. But this job had the power of God to get it done. 120 years. God's work. God's will. But it had to be done God's way. I've watched, uh, I've written this down through the years, and I, as I travel, I even ask people about different men. And I've watched men, I was talking to a man here a while back from Los Angeles, right outside of San Diego, and uh, he's a member of that Scotch Memorial Baptist Church. And I said, uh, Dr. Scott, I said, uh, uh, when you first started out, I said, what happened? He said, well, he said, I'll tell you, Brother Wood, he said, I got in my mind, and for about 15 years, I was in the service, men sinners, and he said, we want a lot of people to the Lord. But he said, I never saw much fruit from that thing because he said, I bypassed the local church. And he said, really, I thought the local church had backslid on God and it was all over. And he said, I ripped myself up and I took my family and I went to the service center. And I, like the law, all of my boys, four boys, and I think about three of them boys are preachers now. And he said, I like to lost my whole family doing my work. I'm here to tell you something. This ain't my work. Somebody said, uh, Brother Wood, what's going on down in Corpus Christi since Brother Wolof died? Uh, it's getting bigger. Do you know that Brother Wolof has moved up three pegs in the top 15 preachers of America on the radio? He's moved up three pegs since he died. Now, you want to know how much God needs you? He could probably get along better without you. A man said to me the other day, he said, well, uh, Brother Wood, what do you think about that work? It takes a half a million dollars a month to run. I'll tell you something. And he ain't behind. I talked to Brother Cameron the other day, and he said, I baptized 70-something one day here just a few weeks back. People are getting saved. People are getting saved. 760 people live on that ranch. Brother Wolof built that thing on the King James Bible and a local church right in the middle of it. They got buses going in that city trying to reach them people for the Lord, trying to get people saved. And if you build anything on the King James Bible, a sinner in a local church, God will bless you. And the gates of hell. Hallelujah. I like this tonight. Ain't you glad you come? Amen. Now you might get this. Nobody didn't ask Noah to build that little boat he built, and so nobody helped him. And so wherever you get, wherever you're going with God, you'll find out <laughs> nobody didn't sin for you, and they ain't going to help you. You have to do the job yourself. And you said, if somebody will just come and help me, God will. Old Jonah got over and started to preach, and he said, "Ain't nobody paying much attention to me." They said, "We didn't send for you." He said, "I'm having to do it all by myself." He said, yeah, that's right. You're the one God told to do it, ain't he? But <laughs> you always complaining about nobody won't help you. We'll just go ahead and do your part. <laughs> and when you get so tired you can't do it anymore, he'll give you strength to do somebody else's. <laughs> I just don't like that. I don't either. That's the way it is. Amen. That's service of God. Amen. Now, I want you to notice something here. This is society that he served, and this service that he done, and here's the suffering that he experienced. 
The serpent he experienced, as every man does. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was evil continually. Now, the suffering that every man experiences is the loneliness of the job. He said, I wish God had put me on top. You better watch out about that top business. I tell you, it ain't near as lonely down here at the bottom because a whole lot of us here. <laughs> but boy, when you get to be a general and God puts you up down there by yourself, that's a lonely job. I'm going to tell you, the thing that's plagued me through the ministry is the loneliness. I have a camp meeting and hundreds and hundreds of people come from everywhere. They flew in from California and Canada and Ohio and Florida. They came from everywhere. <laughs> and folks in Houston didn't come. I guarantee them preachers, they wouldn't get, uh, they just soon had a plague to be near that church. And, uh, and you know, I, I just found out, Lord, I'm sick and tired of being lonely. I mean, what would you want to fellowship with an old backslidden preacher for? I'd go down to that church on Saturday night, John, and we, we got about 35 old boys pray every Saturday night. I have had high 50 down in the last couple of months, and then men be down there just laying all over them floor, just weeping and crying on Saturday night, and about 25 or 30 women over in another building, and they're over there praying, and they all laying on Saturday night just crying and praying and asking God to do something. I'd rather be down there with them and be sitting around a, a cup of coffee, a bunch of preachers talking about somebody. <laughs> Ain't lonely, man. You just go by them. But Tom just lay on them floors and pray and cry. And they love me. That bunch of nuts down there love me. I don't know why. I guess they just don't know me, but they love me. And I mean, the day they said, when you coming home? I mean, they won't know when I'm coming home. And them bad preachers, they hope I don't never come home. Lonely. And I'm telling you, Noah found out when you find grace, you find a lonely life. But all I walked up to me one time, and I was so discouraged. Whew. I'd had the backslide of fellowship myself. And he walked up and he said, It's not near as crowded around this hill as it was, was it? I said, Sir? He said, It's not as crowded around this old blood splattered hill as it was back out there in the world, was it? I said, No, sir, it's not. He said, Son, the closer you get to Calvary, the less folks you'll run into. I ain't never forgot that. I ain't never got that. As close as you live to that cross, the less crowded it gets. And then, boy, you, it gets lonely. On some mission station, it's lonely. And I've seen men backslide on God because uh, they'd go there and fellowship with some ecumenical, some charismatic, just trying to find some fellowship. And then we get up and we tell the world, Christ is all I need. And fellowship. Suffering he experienced. Loneliness. Long hours and long years of hard work and misunderstanding. Worked on that old light and build in the world. Said, what you doing? He said, working for God. That don't seem like nobody's going to help you and you ain't got but eight or ten. I mean, won't you quit? God told me to do it. Long hours. Then life that. Now, this is the suffering. You know, I never did think about this other day, but you know, uh, Noah's mother-in-law didn't get in on that boat. That might be a blessing. <laughs> but you know, I got to think about that thing. You know, his uncles and cousins and nobody got on that boat. What were all the people was that? What were all the family was that? I mean, his boys got on this, wife got on that. <laughs> None of her people got on that, none of his people got on that. All of his kin folks died in that flood. That's something, isn't it? Well, that's strange. Suffering experience. And then, you know, the thing about this is, is it's so lengthy. You know, you, you go through suffering and persecution and, and problems, and, and you say, boy, I'll be glad it's over. Man, I won't. Because I've done learn when this one's over, it's gonna, the next is going to be worse. Sometimes when it gets so dark, I said, Lord, that, that, that's fine, that's okay. Because I know the next trial is going to be darker. And so I, I, just, I just take my time about going through these trials. Because he did say the fiery trial that shall fire you. And I, I've often thought that the first trial I had was the one. And I really believe that there is the fiery trial 
But the last 27, I thought it was it. You didn't get that. But there's a fiery trial. There's one trial above all time that'll try that saint of God. Drop you in that scripture. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You've got to go through that scripture. Because there ain't no polish without the sifter. There ain't no separating that old husk from the real wheat till you get in that sifter. And I'm going to tell you, God puts you in the sifter, not the devil. The devil does the sifter, but he's God's sister. Hallelujah. Look at it now, look at it. The suffering that he experienced. And then the next thing I notice here is he suffered that thing, the scripture that he abided by. The Lord said, Noah, I'd like you to build this ark so long and so wide and so tall and put a window here and a door there. He did it just exactly like God said. Didn't build no handles on the outside to hold on to the end. He just built a door and it got in. And the Bible, you know, I was looking over here tonight and it said, and Noah went in. In verse 7 of chapter 7, and Noah went in. In verse 16, and the Lord shut him in. And then the Lord lifted him above the earth. I like that. He went in, he shut in, he left out. I like that. Now I just wonder tonight, the scripture that abided, he died in that. What God said is all that matters. Brother Dan Matters, it doesn't make any difference if you're ever successful. The thing is, Brother Dan, if you used to abide by the Scripture. When I first started preaching and they used to come to us and tell us, and Bob Jones told us, listen, the old man, we first started preaching, they said, well, now, if you'll join this group and that group, then you'll be successful. Then you'll reach more people. You'll preach to bigger crowds and all this and that. That's not important. The important thing is doing it just like the Scripture says. My wife was talking about a man, and he's been greatly used of the Lord. And my wife just showed me some pictures, and I looked at it. And I, I couldn't go along with the pictures. I couldn't go along with nothing he does. I thank God for every soul and his faith and that man's ministry. I thank God for everything that that man's done, and uh, he's been, uh, he, he's had a, a real, uh, well, I, I don't know what you would call it. But I couldn't go that way. I couldn't live that way. I, I mean, God, I just won't give me any liberty or anything like that. I believe that Noah didn't say, well, now, Lord, I, I could probably haul more if I build it twice as long. God said, I know exactly how long I want it. But the human man, you say, well, brother, would God gave us sense enough to know. No, God didn't give you sense enough to know nothing but what this book says. What this book says, you do it just like God said. Bill Scott said, I didn't do it like God said. I took my family and everything, Brother Wood, and I went down to the Freeman Center and let the church go as she wanted to. But he said, I found out that I was wrong, an old man. It'd be better you find out while you was a young man. Save you a lot of grief and a lot of heartache. A lot of heartache. Scripture, by the by. He did it just like God said, and he did it as long as God said. That's very important. He did just what God said, Brother Tom, but he done it as long as God said. Stood on that street corner and said, Come in, come in, come in. There's a little odd looking woman downtown Houston, Brother Johnny. You've seen her come in our church numbers of times, and she carries a little handful of signs. I don't know anything about it, but she won't talk. But if you go downtown, you won't be there very long. And she says, excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. And I've watched that woman for years and years and years. I don't know anything about it. I don't know where she goes to church. But I'll say one thing. She's been faithful a long, long time. One day I went into the bookstore at home. This old saint of God's gone now. Miss Showalter was her name. She run a Bible book and track store. And uh, I was a rare and young preacher. And uh, she said, how are you getting along, Brother Wood? I said, fine. 
Uh, she said, well, did you preach on the radio today? And I said, yes, I did. I said, I give that Elizabeth Taylor down the river. Oh, she said, that poor little girl. She said, you know the Lord. Laid it on my heart a long time ago to pray for Mr. Taylor. And she said, I've been praying for her since she was about 14 years old. And she said, her and I have been corresponding. And I've been sending her some gospel literature all through the years. Isn't it strange that some of us preachers, even in our toughness and meanness, and we get up and say, well, I'm old Hollywood Harley. But this old saint of God over here, you see, it wasn't a Hollywood Harley. It was a girl going to hell without God. And she writes her little letter. You're writing about a letter. Did you ever write anybody a letter? I got a bad head. You know, Brother Johnny's dad, I wrote some bad letter one time. I, I, I kind of made a, I, I wrote a, an evangelist daddy here while I'm back a letter. And, and, and the daddy picked up the letter. He's a lost Catholic man down in New Orleans. And, and he picked up that letter and he read it. And he owns a boat company. And, and I told him his boy got saved and, and everything. His boy maybe a little overzealous. And, and, and I told him about this boy and how he got saved, how he was respected. And I told him, I said, dear sir. I know you and your wife must be fine people to raise this kind of boy and give him to the Christian wild child like you. That old man stood there and read that letter. Tears began to run down his face. He said, boy, did you tell that man to write me a letter? He said, no, I said, I never told that man to write you nothing. And about two or three weeks later, he didn't have nothing to do with that boy. This big rich man, yes, he called that boy and he said, he said, I'll tell you what, son. He said, Glenn, I believe he said, you want that brand new Oldsmobile sitting there? And he said, well, you know, Dad, I'm ragged evangelist without nothing. He said, you can have it. Just go ahead and take it. A few months later, he called him in and he said, Glenn, I won't know how much money you paid income tax on last year, he told him. He said, if you don't mind me doing it, he said, I'd like this carry going to books here for $1,000 a month. He said, you want to come in and work once in a while when you're home? Okay, but he said, uh, uh, your wife will get a check two hundred fifty dollars a week now. Just a letter. It didn't hurt that day. He said, I don't think you'll take that check. I, I didn't have any problem taking Papa's money. I wouldn't want to take the world's money. But if my daddy wanted to help me in his loss, that'd be all right. I wouldn't say, no, you can't help me. Well, Scott, you need to get saved. That's what most of them going to hell, right now. That's that. That's that old daddy, you know what he did? God smote him with that letter. And now, I just like to write him like I like to write people personal letters. And sometimes I just like to write people letters off in distant cities that's been a blessing to me and say, Dear sir, or dear lady, dear whoever it is, I, I just appreciate you and the years you stood for God. Sometimes in dark hours, people get a letter like that. It really encourages Maybe just a little telephone call. My wife said, Do you know how much your telephone is? I said, Don't tell me. About it now. I'm going to tell you something. He quit when God said to him. He didn't have, need a vision from God to build that thing. <laughs> he had him a verse. And a verse is a lot better than a vision. Amen, brother Wood. Some of us Baptists are looking for a call. You better get you a verse. But when that call gets mighty dim and your mind can't, you can go back to that verse and read it again. If you got that verse, you lay that on the devil, that'll handle it. I better get off of that. I'll deal with that some other time. Scripture abided by it. Now, you'll notice Noah here. His sufficiency was in God. John, the theme song of our church for years has been, Christ is all I need. But, that's not so in the Christian world. Christ is all I need and preach. I've heard people just say, Brother Wood, if I didn't preach, I'd just be backslid. No, you're already backslid. You don't know it. Christ is all I need and teach the Sunday school class. Christ is all I need to be a pastor of the church. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Period. Nothing else. If you add anything else to that, you've added to the Lord Jesus. I, I, when I first got saved, Tom, I remember when I first got saved, man, I told my wife, I said, she wasn't saved. I said, 
Man, it's wonderful to be saved. I mean, I'd met the Lord Jesus, and it was something personal, an old junkie, an old bad drug, an old criminal. I mean, got saved. And woke up the next morning with a piece of God in my heart. And, and I'd run to that Bible, I had a little zipper Bible, just like I got right here, and I'd read that thing, and, and she said, Jack, you sure read a lot. Man, I just read books of the Bible. I mean, I had been saved no time. I done went through that Bible. I, I started looking at it again. I said, man, this is wonderful. I ain't never been to nobody's church. I ain't, I ain't never been around none of God's people. I said, man, this is wonderful. But you know what? Through all this premillennial doctrine, and I love that doctrine, and uh, uh, A.B. 1611, we just about run all of the Jesus out of this thing. And it's just about to become a religion, does right? I believe the Bible. I am a Bible believer. You believe that verse where it said, and they went from house to house? You believe that verse where it says they gave all? You believe that verse? You believe that? Yeah, there's a lot of verses in there to believe. You say you believe it all. Christ is all sufficient. You know what's building on that earth? The mother in law said, You're going to have all them kids' minds what? He said, Yes, ma'am, that's right. He's all I need. He's all just kept building and praying and working and sweating. What do you mean? You say, I just want to do something for God. You're full of the devil. You can't do nothing for God. If you'll ever get quiet, I'll tell you what, he'll do something for you. You can't have a lot. You can't have it. We live in a time of pacific. And... You know, an old Englishman, I won't call a man's name, but he's a great preacher. He jumped up on the pew and he run back there and back here and back down there. And he said, we do something in the church. And this Englishman, he said, and he says, Sam. And he said to me, my brother, what in the world is that man doing? My brother, what is that man doing? This great preacher, God, thank you, sir. What my brother is he doing? My brother, a lot of flesh here. I didn't tell you to come to church and do something. God told us to come here to meet sometime. We need to get acquainted with our Heavenly Father. Well, you can ask me anything about my daddy, John. I can tell you. Hey, John, I can tell you when he was born and where he was born and where his daddy was born and what my granddaddy was born and what war they fought in. I can take you back when they fought the British, John. I can tell you all about them. I'm acquainted with the wood clan. My granddaddy was born in 1855 in Joplin, New Jersey. Mary Joanna was my grandmother was born in 1960. 1861, the year the war broke out between them all. I know exactly where my people came from. They came over from England. I know exactly where they came from. They said they lived up at Sammy between them Scotsmen and when there's a fighting. They said the woods, as they call them, the woods people, because they lived in the woods and stole from the British and sold to the Scottish, sold from the Scottish, sold to the British. Because you ever find the woods, he's leading the horse. I don't care what. How come you interested in your stock? That's my father. When I got saved. I want to know about my father. I want to get acquainted with him. I want to find out what kind of inheritance they left me. What I had coming and what I didn't have coming. What he expected out of me and what he didn't expect out of me. I want to know something about my father. And I want to tell you that and I found out he's all sufficient. The world said, get away from us. I said, yes, sir. He said, come close. And I read a little old book one time. And I don't even remember much about the book. And I read Ellie Maxwell's book on Crowd of the Christ. And, uh, and uh, Maxwell said, when the world and religion begin to crowd down, it can crowd you too fast. Or it can crowd you completely away from Christ. And that's true. So you can either get crowded to him, away from him. And the question is, where are you at? Away from him or to him? He said, Preacher, I'm going through some trials. Yes. Welcome to the club. 
I hate to tell you this, but that's where the Lord is at. The Bible says the disciples were in the storm, and they knew not that it was the Lord. <laughs> you let the waves blow. And you know, it even said the time that the ship was full of water. And when it gets full, it's about time to get out. Somebody said, do you know why Peter sunk? I said, sure. He got out of the boat. He didn't say no food for you Oh, you said the reason he sunk was when he got his eye off. Well, the reason he sunk, he got out of the boat. If he stayed in that boat, hey, what did God tell him to do? What did God tell him to do? Get in that boat and go to the other side. And when the boat got full, he said, Lord, I'd like to walk on the water. Well, all he had to do is get in the boat and start walking around. It's full. <laughs> Amen. It's plumb full. I thought when it's full, that means it's running out. And when you're in a boat in the middle of the ocean, it's running out. It's time to get out. But God always goes contrary to circumstances. And God said, get in that boat and go to the other side. I don't care how much water you put in there or how many holes you put in there. God told you, get in that boat and go to the other side. That boat's going to the other side. And all your problem is, is staying in that boat. When the storm comes, water comes, everybody's going to sleep. And you'll think God's around. He's right there. Well, he said, I'll never leave you. He's right there. He's all sufficient. I'm going to close. I know you don't think I am. I'm afraid if I can win sleep. But his sufficient was in God. He had a wonderful ministry. Had a wonderful family. He even made a wonderful trip. He said, poor old no. Poor old no. He had a floating zoo. Think about that. I know it could have got kind of smelly along the way, but it was a wonderful time. Amen. I've often wondered who used the shovel. I bet that was. Amen. But he learned it. This guy, I'm having trouble stepping on this. But he had a wonderful landing place. I bet he looked around and he said, I wonder where the rabbi is at. I wonder where Dr. Smooth mouth is. Where do all them preachers at? I don't even see their church anymore. Oh, I'll be glad. Well, well, well. Ain't nobody here but me and God. Is this so? They told me I was crazy. I got the whole thing now. And thank God God's going to clean it up. He walked around and around. He said, I wonder where that bunch of rubber are at. They're gone. Hey, one of these days, I'm going to wake up in another world, yeah. and there ain't going to be that. Yeah. ain't going to be none of these monstrosities. There ain't going to be none of this stubborn society. There ain't going to be no suffering experience. Hey, we're headed to another world. He had a wonderful landing. Now, I want you to notice something, if you will. His sufficient was in God, but he was successful. He made the whole thing. Jesus said, it's in the days of Noah. Paul said over in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews when he put all his Hall of Famers in there, you know. Sir? All them Hall of Famers in there. He said, Noah being warned of God, prepared an ark for the saving of the times. Think about that just a minute. Think about this just a minute. He was successful. You said, Brother Jack, more than anything, Brother Johnny, you won't mind. Brother John finished uh, uh, college and in the, in the uh, pastor church three or four years. I preached him a little meeting. And uh, one day I was off in Florida somewhere preaching. And my wife called me and said, uh, Brother, Brother John is down in Houston. I said, Brother John Thompson's over here. I said, well, I said, what's that Indian doing? She said, oh, no, not that John Thompson. The other John Thompson. We got one big John Thompson and we got this little John Thompson. And uh, the big John Thompson weighs about 350. And I said, what's he doing now? She said, well, he said God told him something else. We've been there about seven years, John. And, uh, and you know, he'd meet his preacher friends around the country, and they said, what are you doing? He said, I'm down with Brother Jack Wood. A year went by, two years went by, and said, people would say, well, aren't you, uh, <laughs> don't you uh, sometimes want to get into the ministry? You know, just leading, singing for Brother Wood, and winning souls, and teaching in a Bible school. Wouldn't you like to get into the ministry? Pukey, pukey, pukey. Half the people saying that don't even know what the ministry is. And if they run square head on into it, they wouldn't know how to do it. 
And so through them years of experience, they're right there with me. Brother John, never one time, seven years has passed now, and God has led him into something else and opened the door for him, and people are being saved, and, uh, and he meets some of his friends. We have 281 and a half in Sunday school. And this last year, 282 and a third. Do you happen to know a church that you could recommend me to? One boy said to, to my son-in-law, he said, your brother Jack's a sister. Don't you ever get lonesome to be in the parsonage again? He was in his fifth one in the last six years. And some of the wives, well, Johnny, they, they think he went out of the ministry. You know, leading the thing for God's man. Did you mean this boy? We've traveled up and down this land from the length of it to the back of it. We've been to the north top of it to the bottom of it. We've been at it. Since I've been in Florida, they've called me. They've asked me to come to California. To, I, I don't know what all. Only the Lord knows. I ain't going to go. I'm going to give out now. When are you going to get in the ministry, brother John? Don't you know you can get in the ministry? The ministry, I told some of the men today, I had a man teaching for me. He had about 40 in his Sunday school class. I taught it last Sunday. He had 130 in it. But uh, Sunday week ago, and he told me, he said, I've got to get into the ministry. He's in his third church now in the last six years. Ain't never had over 25. And all 25 in each place were so happy when he left. I wonder why a guy runs off and gets 25 when he already had 35 years. He's got a good job here. He's paying. He don't have all the responsibility. And he's winning souls and God's the rest. I've got to get into the ministry. No, you know wrong. What you want, you want you a pulpit where you can exercise on authority. Did you ain't got sense enough to handle it? You're like handling dynamite. It blows something up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Successful. See, he was used of God to perform a miracle. And what happened in Noah's day was a miracle. Woo! He gone. They said, where's he going? Some guy standing in the tree said, where's he going? Some guy then climbs to the top of the mountain and said, woo, look over yonder. There goes that old crazy creature in that boat. He performed the miracle. I'm going to tell you something. God used him to save the world. Strange how God works. A little nobody. I mean, that's guy in no God. You say, Brother Jack, he's got a hand full. That's a whole lot of God that gets a hold of him. Did you, did you ever read that uh, verse of Scripture where that boy had them uh, five sardines and two biscuits and, and God got a hold of them things and blessed them and fed everybody? You said, God ain't never done that for me. Has he ever had them five biscuits and two sardines in his hand? Sometimes we put in God's hand, we pick it up and take it with us. And we bring it back, we put it in God's hand, we take it back. And we bring it down, put it on the altar, we pick it up and take it back home with us. never committed to God. And Noah said, well, I don't know how to do anything else. I'm not much of a preacher. And he warned the wicked. And he built this little boat. And he opened the door and they all got in. He sat down. And he wasn't sitting there wringing his hands worried. And he wasn't worried if he had the real salvation or not. And the Bible said, God, shut that door. Rain began to trickle down. Ooh. And you'll notice that all the judgment was on the ark, not on the inside. And that thing was going through the storm and every tree or mountain, whatever it hit, or whatever it bumped against, the ark took all the shock. Noah said, ride free by grace. <laughs> Noah, ride free. And God used him to save the world. And you've got no idea tonight what God has got for you. Your job is to prepare the ark. It's God's job to save the world. And I thought, my wife and I went to Houston and opened the work up in 57, and the world said, you're not educated enough. I said, amen. And they said, you're not smart enough. And I said, amen. And they said, you don't have enough Bible plans. I said, amen. You know, sometimes it's better to agree with your adversary. And they said, you're crazy. I said, amen. They said, you don't know nothing. Amen. That's right. But I know God. 
the old preacher right along. He told me, he said, you ain't never on the mouth of nothing. Bro. You preach too loud, and Jack, you've got a, a direct way of speaking to people. And you've got to kind of get indirect with this thing, kind of sneak up on them. I ain't trying to sneak up on nobody. I'm trying to hit you right square in your nose. When I fight, I don't, I don't try to sneak around here and punch you a little bit here. I'm going to hit you right square in your nose and kick you to I'm, you know, I'm, That's all I know. I'm going to just do it right. I mean, die no preacher told me. He's in heaven tonight. Why don't he pick me up a many times and strung me up? I appreciate the old man. But he said, Jack, I had more to try him one time. He said, he tore my church up. And I'm telling you, Jack, get away from people. He said, I broke all up. He said, I went to school with him. But said, he said, I was down to the and I heard him say this, Jack. Said, I heard him say that if God wanted you to smoke, he'd put a chimney on top of your head. And he said, that ain't the way to talk to God's people. The Lord began to lead me in. My wife put the little old tent up, 57. The Lord began to preach. And I never will forget, there's a man laying dying tonight in Houston. was saved in that old tent, Bill Sasser. Old Claude Pilgrim, remember my church tonight. I was in 57. In 60, old brother Whitford's still there with me. He got saved in 60. My, the Lord. I baptized his wife, my organist now. I baptized him in 60. And them girls were saved. I look across that congregation sometimes. And Sunday morning I went there and we run between 250 and 300 every Sunday morning. And that preacher told me that when he died here a while back. That's my dad. He'd come over and preach a sermon. One of the 14 people left. This old building in Robert's down. It's awful. I, I wasn't happy about it. Big old white column down in front of the church. Her nice for that and them. And they sold it to the Mexican people. And they went in and made a beautiful church. And I'm so glad. The testimony said. But that's where we grew up as kids. I said, Jack, you don't quit preaching them people. You'll never be a success. And I preached for 20 years, and like he said, nobody came. And then 25 years. And then when I passed that 25 year marker, I guess God said, okay, I'll let you go. And the other day, one of the big men in America, and it don't mean a thing to me, except I said to the Lord, I said, you heard what they said? The man called me from Dallas and he said, Would you come hold me a meeting, Jack, in January of 85? And I said, Yes, sir. And I told Wabba and I said, You know, it's the first one of those big churches I ever got into. First one there let me preach. Thanks, God. Fuck that. He heard me preach over on the conference and he said, I want you to come preach. That man taught me in Bible. But the old brother told me, said, You don't quit looking at people right in the face and pointing your finger at them. You're going to wind up with no place to preach. And my old brother, he wound up the building falling in on him. He lost all of his children. Every one of them. The boy surrendered the same day I did and said God called him to preach. And then later, his wife left him and he said he was an infidel. He didn't believe there was a God. I said, my, my, my. The old gentleman was wrong one. It was crazy, we mixed up world. When Noah found grace, Johnny looked around for him and preached. And God done what he wanted to with Noah. Noah didn't tell God what to do. God told Noah what to do. And what we're doing today, preacher boy, we're telling God what to do. But God's looking for some men and he can tell what to do. He's looking for a lady. He said, lady, go next door and do so and so. They were successful. Jesus said, uh, I'd like to tell you about Noah. So, Tom, I've often wondered about it. When John the Baptist died, Jesus said, he never even went to his funeral. Strange, isn't it? He went to the widow woman's boy's funeral. He went to Lazarus's. I wonder why he didn't go to John. But you know what he said? He said, ain't never been a man born to woman greater than John. Hey, that wasn't Brother John Thompson or Jack Woods giving him a recommendation. That was the Lord Jesus Christ said that. 
we turn to the 11th chapter of Hebrews and the Apostle Paul said, I'd like to tell you about an old man named Noah. Fear of God in his heart. And he prepared an ark for the saving of his house. God said, write that down, Paul, I like it. Jesus said something about a great man. Paul said something about a great man. And neither one of them ever had 30 people. Isn't that strange? Now, if they'd had a thousand, we'd have understood that in this day and time. But they didn't have anybody, and everybody John had was leaving and going over there to be with Jesus. And they said, hey, all of your disciples are leaving. He said, yeah, I must decrease. He must increase. Did you get it? We don't want to in decrease. We want to increase. Let's pray. I believe the Lord wants us to pray. Everyone pray. In just a moment. Just a moment. I want to pray with you. Used of God to save a world. Used of God to doom the wicked. The other day in Houston, Texas, Brother John joined arms with three other men. Thousands upon thousands of homosexuals. And then march, just march through the crowd, arm in arm, screaming, the wrath of God. The wrath of God's coming. God rained down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. They seal in the doom of the wicked. That's what Noah did. But he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. If you ever accomplish anything as a missionary, if you ever accomplish anything as a young man of God, Young lady, if you ever accomplish anything, it'll be because of the grace of God. You know that, but you've never experienced it. But God will let you experience this. Now, God wants to do something to your heart tonight. He wants to take it and mash it and crush it and stomp it until all the juice runs out of your eyeballs that you've never seen before. When all of it stomped and crushed, God will pick up them pieces and use it as the master craftsman. Father, we thank you for the goodness of God tonight and the grace of God. There's those here, Lord, who are saved just never really got involved in the work of God. Never becomes burdened for a sick, sick society. We look at the young people and criticize them. We look at the Cassius Clays and the Muhammad Ali's and criticize them as they march into hell. We look at the movie stars that live wicked and even many times forget to ever, ever pray for them. And Lord God, you said, call unto me and I will answer thee. God, make us praying people. Raise up some praying people that can get a hold of God and get a hold of God for a lost world tonight. This town, Lord, has been preached to and been preached out over the radio and got churches on every corner and she's still going to hell tonight. And if somebody don't stop and pray, she'll be on her way to hell the next time we come back. But, oh God, tonight... May you raise up some intercessors tonight that will stand between you and a godless world and say, Oh God, do something in my day that the world won't even believe. Speak, Lord. Speak tonight to some drooping heart here tonight that they might find grace to go on with God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's all stand. Why don't you just bow your head? Just bow your head reverently and listen to Brother John as he sings.
Scotland. He's everything you'll ever need. Weary soldier, he's all the refreshment you'll ever need. Man of the world, he's all the wealth. Let God, let God speak to your heart. everything you need. He's all sufficient tonight. Well, John, lead the whole congregation. This all singing. Some are coming. Some people are kneeling in the altar. I believe everybody ought to sing this song. You, you'll learn it for the week's over. Years ago, in our family, there was a man named Pink Lindley. He was a gypsy, he was a traveler, and he was the worst drunkard that I guess I ever knew. And one night, on the, one day on the street corner in Corsicana, Texas, somebody got to Pink Lindley and told old Pink about the Lord, and he got saved. He was about 55. When he got saved, and being a gypsy and a traveler, he'd never been to school. Old Pink got saved. Preacher marked the Bible in the third chapter of John. And Pink could walk around with the Bible on his hand. Couldn't read one word of it. Didn't have any idea what it said. He told all of our family and our friends, he said, read right there. They'd read that third chapter of John. He'd turn them over two or three other chapters he had Mark and tell them, read that. He'd get out and pray with them. God used Pink Lindley to win a many a man to God. Well, John Ingalls, the first cousin of mine, he saved tonight. John can't read a word. Uncle Lloyd Richardson got saved, one of the wickedest men I ever knew. They went to San Antonio, went out to a camp, a bunch of gypsy work, and got 22 people. Took them one night to the Belvedere Baptist Church, Brother Jack Rotan, the pastor, walked in there with 22 unsaved gypsy boys and girls. That night, every one of them got saved. I mean, every one of them. Jack Rotan told me, he said, I thought I had an invasion of charismatics. There's lost sinners coming to God. What happened? Well, Pink Lindley got saved. And old Pink kneel down to pray. So Tom and he said, Lord, it's old Pink again. <laughs> every time he ever prayed, he said, Dear Lord, it's old Pink again. Pink's sister died. He went to the funeral. Told everybody there how to be saved. He got them all in there and he said, I want you all to kneel down. I just want to pray for you. And old Pink kneeled down to pray and he said, Dear God, it's old Pink again. <laughs> everybody waited for him to say something else. They looked up and old Pink and went home. He died right there on his knees. 
You know what Pete found out? He didn't need no education. He didn't need no Bible school training. He didn't even know how to read. He had one half of his family to God and sinners by the multitudes in the whole country was talking about, man, did you ever meet Pink Lindley? Got out to pray one day and said, Whoop. We said, good morning, Lord. How are you doing? Sure is good to see you face to face. One day, me and you going to lay down. And I hope when we go, we're saying, Lord, it's me again. You know me, Lord, I've always needed you. It's me. Let's sing one other verse, that brother Johnny. To the Lamb. said to me a few years, a good many years back. I was kind of young and full of energy, kind of a tiger. And she said, you know, Jack, she said, my Jesus and your Jesus seems to be two different people. She said, you see him coming with a sword. And she said, I see him coming with nail-pierced hands. I've thought about that through the years, Father Bob. And this young man, you might see him as a lion from the tribe of Judah, and he is. Don't let me mislead you. He is. But, but all the way through the book of Revelation, Tom, it still says, Behold the Lamb. And there's never a time in time or eternity where he ever ceases to be the Lamb. God bless you, Brother Tom. Thank you, Brother Jack. And uh, I tell you what, we're not going to get any more invitation. We're going to go home. Amen. Now, before you go, let me ask you to do this. You want these revival posters? Take that home with you. Either give it to someone, or call someone, or visit someone, and get them to come to the meeting tomorrow night. Will you do that? I just be faithful. Maybe you say, "Well, I got to go somewhere else tomorrow night." How about Thursday night, Friday night, amen? Just get somebody to the meeting, and especially somebody that's unsaved. God will bless you if you'll just obey. Call somebody, invite someone. Just take that, that post as a reminder that you need to do something for God, amen? And let's do that, all right? All right, let's bow our heads in a word of prayer, and we appreciate all of our visitors. We appreciate you coming tonight. Come back to be with us again. I'm going to ask Brother uh, Delaney, missionary to Ireland, if you will, tonight. Brother Delaney, you ask God to bless the meeting and dismiss us for this love. Amen. Amen.